interior. Restaurant. Bar. Club. Day. Night. Action! Hello, everyone. You are listening to Restaurant Fiction, the podcast that reviews every fictional restaurant, bar, and club in TV and film, then takes a deep dive into the screenwriting process, the creative process, the production process, the Hollywood magical business and creative process that brings said world, said foodie, club, bar, cocktail world to life. My name is Monis Rose, and today we are talking about a turkey scene, a Thanksgiving scene. Yes, one, maybe two, maybe three, that's up in the year, of Thanksgiving scenes. They were at the Krajinsky residence. Restaurant Fiction knows about this scene, these scenes, but... We're going to tell you something. We have never, ever watched the entire movie of Avalon where these Thanksgiving dinner scenes take place, where they are from. Well, we watched the movie. And it's one of those films that is a slow burn. We kind of wanted to turn it off within five to ten minutes because, you know, doesn't capture or catch our attention. But there was something, something about it that held our interest to the very end. And by the time the credits rolled, our eyes were sobbing. We don't know why. The last two films to do that was were number one, Up, of course. Number two, dare we say it, The Notebook. That's right. One of the draws of this movie. One of the reasons why we even watched the entire piece of art in the first place were because of the Thanksgiving scenes. And we brought along an amazing, awesome expert of these Thanksgiving scenes and of the movie Avalon. And that is A.E. Jones. A.E. Jones is a manager with Stagecoach Entertainment. A.E. Jones knows turkey dinners more than anyone else. Here's why. Go. Restaurant Fiction, we dined. We dined at a residence, at the Krajinsky Residence in Baltimore. These are first and second generation Americans. Now, Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And just like what I mean by that is when you go to the Krajinsky, excuse my uh, pronunciation there, when you go inside their residence and you dine at their Thanksgiving table, that is just it. A cigar is just a cigar. A turkey is just a turkey. Now, mind you, some people at this family table might think this Thanksgiving, this bird is something more. Some people might think it is the meaning of what it means to be an American. Some might think it is like a power play, you know, of who is the alpha. Uh, you know, some just might be nostalgic of their first time coming to America. But really, it's just about the bird. And the bird is the word at this dining table. Now, what, what makes this bird so special is it? it's just baked. I mean, it possibly is, um, you know, maybe a dry brine, but who's really to say? And when it is carved, you see, and this bird is waiting, and it is waiting and waiting. And you might think that that's ruining the bird, but it's not. You see, when it's taken out of the oven, um, 
and it's taken out a little too early, you know, and that's, that's actually okay. Kind of like a steak because it is cooking internally outside, you know, it is so hot it's just cooking and cooking and cooking. So then when it is cut and you hear that crisp crunch right at that breast, right at that white meat, you know, the most, uh, the hardest part to get right. Well, guess what? It is, it, it just is. And it is flawless. It is Goldilocks just right. And when you are dining at this table, and if you cannot handle the adults and their dynamics and the bureaucracies that are said and just the whole mishugas, if you will, well, then just go to the kids' table because they're uh, drinking their knee highs and the Coca Colas. And like we said, a cigar is just a cigar into them. A turkey is just a turkey, and they just want to eat and move on with their lives. Anyway, that is our little quick review of the Thanksgiving dinner scene or scenes in the 1990 film directed by Barry Levinson, Avalon. We are talking to A.E. Jones. A.E., this movie has meant so much to you in your life. Uh, please tell us uh, what we got right, what we got wrong. What would you like to add to this awesome dinner scene? So while you were reading that, most of my thoughts were going to my own family Thanksgivings when I was a child, because like I said, this is my family. And I recognized in this film how much this was my family before I even knew our family came from Polish and German Jews. <laughs> that was a surprise when I was 15. <laughs> you got it really right in so many ways, because there is just the weirdest thing, at least in my first and second generation family, where like the turkey as symbolic of America and the, and and how to be the most American, because again, like the goal was assimilation. The goal was to whitewash yourself. And so to have that, there is so much around that turkey at least if you're in my kind of first or second generation family, that like it is the, the culmination of the year even more than Christmas because Christmas, it was totally secular and it was just an excuse for my grandma to have a party. <laughs> That's awesome. So like what other joys do you get out of Avalon and this Thanksgiving scene? Well, like I said, for Avalon in general, it really is the story of my family. My my grandfather was... <laughs> I was like, this is very Dickensian. My grandfather was a Polish Jewish orphan, <laughs> truly. He had an aunt that had emigrated to the United States, was able to find him and bring him over. So that's how he got to the States. And that was probably in the late 20s. So it's like not so far off from where Sam Kaczynski gets off in 1914 America. And then my grandmother, actually, she had an older sister. So like when we talk about the other family members who come over, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> it's spot on. <laughs> so my old, my great aunt was the black sheep of the family. Five feet tall and a redheaded Ashkenazi Jew. She was amazing. She came over to the States and started working in nightclubs in New York, was able to get, and this is like in their early 30s, and this is Germany, and they're Jewish, and she was able to get two visas, except the one big problem was she had 12 brothers and sisters and, a, and parents, but she only had two visas. And so, like, this is something Avalon very much glosses over because it's about, like, the beauty of being American and being completely assimilated into, quote unquote, our culture is they forget how many people were running for their lives. So the idea that you can truly drop the trauma of your past, the pain of your past, the, I mean, like, my 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 aunt had two visas. She chose her favorite brother and her favorite sister. And luckily for all of us, the favorite sister was my grandmother. And we don't know what happened to the rest of the family, truly. And that's the reality of the situation. And so when you think about the arc of life in Avalon and about how important it was to be American, it's because when you've already experienced that level of loss, 
and that level of disconnectedness from your previous culture, you'll do anything to fit in. And that's at least what I get out of the movie on a different side of it, because since I lived it in my own family, there's probably a lot of different things that I see into it. We're like now watching this movie since I was nine years old in 1990. So I've been watching it for over 30 years now. My perspective on it has grown as much as that arc is shown in that movie. It seems like, you know, we're going to back and we're going to go a little back and forth between Thanksgiving, you know, traditions in Avalon here really quick. So uh, for uh-huh. those who have not seen Avalon, one of the uh, quintessential scenes is a Thanksgiving dinner scene where the Krajinski or a part of the Krajinski family is waiting for one of the uncles or the brother of the patriarch to come and cut the turkey. It is like a big tradition. So E, in your own real life, how long, whether it is family or a friend, how long are you waiting until it's like, you know what, let's just eat? So this is the amazing thing about my family. Our t- our sense of timing is supernatural. And so one of the absolute favorite things that happens in my family and has happened for generations is cooking. And so all of us have really developed this kind of sixth sense of organization and timing. So it's like, We all get together and plan the menu. That's the other thing. Our Thanksgiving menu has probably not changed since the (laughs) mid-70s. Like it's probably been this, it's probably been the same or a similar version of the menu um, since my parents got married. And my parents have been married for 49 years. Um, so when we talk about the importance of tradition, especially in this movie, that is exact exactly to how my my family lives so because we know the menu so well because we update over time because we are organized af and my mom and i get together every single year and we review the notes from the previous thanksgiving about what to change or what to update or what to keep exactly the same and then the whole family gathers we all know what our jobs are we do everything that we can to like do the timing so here's the thing folks we pad in half an hour of extra time just in case you're going to be late but if you miss that end of that cocktail hour sorry baby our timing's on yours is off <laughs> <laughs> well really quick tell us about your own things so what is this amazing uh, thanksgiving feast of your own with the family this this uh big piece that goes back since the 1970s okay so clearly the centerpiece is the bird the bird has developed into well number one no matter how many people are coming for thanksgiving it is a legit game and competition to see who can find the biggest turkey at costco whenever we go my mom like there's like this time when like my mom and i went this is obviously pre-covid in the before time the case at costco is like three or four people deep and i looked at my mom and i was like i'm gonna get the biggest turkey and i just plowed in there (laughs) so number one as big and bad as possible and two my brother is the grill master he has been training since he was 13 years old (laughs) So he, it's just, it's the tradition and tradition means you get to continually practice it. So my brother now smokes the most beautiful, gorgeous, gigantic bird with like the crispiest, smokiest crust and the juiciest, juiciest inside. Number one. Number two, mashed potatoes. Mashed potatoes are generally go between either my mom or me, and it'll change a little bit depending on who's doing what. I prefer to put in cheese because it's cheese. My mom goes a little bit more of just like the creamy traditional route. We used to do a green bean casserole until I found out that I was allergic to onions. (laughs) So now we do green beans, almondine. We always do an herbed monkey bread. You know, like normally with like a dessert monkey bread, you'll roll everything in like in cinnamon and sugar, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) (laughs) We roll ours 
and a combination of flavored olive oil and butter and then individually roll them all in herbs. So what you'll get, especially in our bunk cake, because we see, use the same bunk cake we, we have for 50 years, <laughs> is it's almost like a game to be like, how can we have the butteriest, crispiest, most amazing monkey bread ever? Um, and then dessert is, and that's, that's generally the meal. Cause now, oh, cause you know, we've lost many people over the years from our family and, you know, like time has gone on. And so it's mostly just my, my parents, me and my brother, and now my spouse. Um, and <laughs> part of the reason spouse even got into the family was because they are just as big of a foodie human as the rest of us and started contributing right away to our meals. So that brings us to dessert where they make apple pie and I make pumpkin cheesecake. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm not gonna lie. That's uh that's one hell of a meal. And for our listeners, if you're not drooling like Pavlov's dog right now, then you can turn <laughs> off and then you don't belong you don't you can't listen to restaurant fiction anymore i'm sorry about that <laughs> it is quite the meal and we i look forward to like and this is the other thing that's like very like avalon is whenever we're eating food we're talking about other food that we want to make <laughs> and it's like so our thanksgiving conversation is basically talking about other food we want to make usually pre-planning our christmas which is also a set menu and then interspersed with all of that are all of our favorite family stories from over the years. Of all the American holidays, why do you think for the Krachinskis, and maybe you can relate it to your own family, like why Thanksgiving? Like, I mean, and, and in Avalon, one of the other American holidays that is a constant motif is, say, Fourth of July, which, does, you know, it's more like barbecue-esque, you know, and watermelon, but mm -hmm. really what are the reasons you think for Thanksgiving? I can tell you specifically why for my family. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of this, a lot of similar things that kind of happen in Avalon. And for my family, remember, one of them was an orphan and the other one grew up in a Jewish ghetto and then they had nothing. So the fact that they could come to America and even as like my my great aunt, my grandmother were waitresses their entire careers, just waitresses and um, and amazing waitresses that the fact that they could do that job and always have access to safe ingredients, to real butter, to milk, to these things that were just on display in America, like it's like this is the very beginning of like the most hardcore cap like capitalist part of our modern era where consumption was a sign of success. And so to come from such and that was the thing is like my my mom still my mom and and my dad actually in, in different ways, but we're gonna focus on my mom's side of the family because this is the closest. Um, grew up very, very poor. But number one, the food. The food was always quality. And so to be able to have a holiday that is just about the quality of your food, again, when you come from not having access to any of these things, it is a celebration. And it does deserve time. And that's kind of how I see it over my lifetime. That's how I interpret it. Whether it is the first time you ever saw Avalon or the most recent time, I need you to use your imagination for a second. So first of all, you are invited to the Krasinski Thanksgiving dinner. Number one, what are you eating? I am always a really good guest. You try a little bit of everything. You try a little bit of everything and you figure and you find out who cooked what. And you find something nice to say about everything that they cooked. Even if it was, that was a great effort. Oh, that's good. Could I even use that in my own <laughs> personal life? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you really went for it. <laughs> it's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> wow. All right. Awesome. We got to record. All right. Excellent. 
And here's the biggest one. And this is just the Krajinskis. Um, what are you arguing about? Television. Tell me more. Absolutely. Well, because this is the other ultra American thing that is a runner throughout this movie is the importance and the change and the way that television really changes culture, particularly within families as the generations pass. So it would be like, what's your, what's your favorite? What do you hate? I love the, what do you hate question? Because the passion with which people hate things is still truly stunning and very American. Um, (laughs) And, you know, so what do you love? What do you hate? And these are the same kinds of things that like I'm talking about with my family that throughout the years, as I have figured out my family's taste, I was the youngest. So I was always at the mercy of what everybody else wanted to watch. And that's kind of how I developed what I watched because I got very fascinated with what other people watch. So it's not at all surprising that I'm working in television now. (laughs) And yeah, and so like those are, my brother's an English teacher. So we always talk about story. And I totally like, I could argue about story with this family for days, for days, I am sure. (laughs) <laughs> all right so uh we're going to we're going to move on to now more like man now you are a manager and we're going to move on to more manager writer questions are you mm-hmm. cool with that and we'll get back maybe to let's uh, it. awesome let's do it okay so how important is say uh breaking bread with clients If there's one nice thing about COVID and Zoom is that it's made it so much more accessible for me to meet with people. And that has been great for laying the foundations of relationships, just like, you know, using I am the when I was first an agency assistant was the way that I it was always electronic to some extent. So if I develop any kind of like rapport with someone online, the next thing that I do is like, can we hang out in person? talk shit because (laughs) this industry is just so unbelievably frustrating that sometimes the way you find who you want to work with is people who talk shit in the same language that you do and what I mean is more like for me I'm always looking for the people who are like analyzing how to make it better analyzing how to expand analyzing how to progress and move forward If someone comes to me and says, like, and starts bitching about, like, let me tell you about this disorganized nonsense, I'm like, oh, type A, come to me, my child, come to me. And sometimes those are things that you can only learn in person. And also, especially for me as a manager, the process of relationship and building trust while working on strategy in an incredibly competitive and difficult environment being able to share space and share energy if we want to get all if we want to get woo woo about it but like just share time which is my love language which is how do you spend your time and if you can do that effectively with someone else I think you do need to figure that out in person and then the relationship can develop from there and I think all relationships today are just as much about being in person as they are about being online and making sure that those things match because that is kind of like the next level of trust building that we're in what are you looking for in signing new writers let us preface with the disclaimer of everything everyone is a unique special snowflake and quite genuinely if i'm pursuing a client or i am discussing a you know perhaps a recommendation between like an agent or something like that i'm always going to individualize what i think is right and how to how to approach that That being said, what I generally look for is someone who personifies what I've always taught as the writer's triangle, which is someone who always kind of understands and looks at their writing and looks at themselves and looks at their career as these like three points of a triangle and can then iterate on what do I do next? What does the market want? What do I want? Where is my skill set? How do I turn this into a day job? one of the hardest things to do. How do I build clout so I can do my own projects? I look for people who already kind of understand that. And that's usually people who are working directly 
in the business in some capacity. And that can be a few different things depending on what that person wants to do. Number one, two, as you have heard me describe the insane timing and note-taking process that my family goes through for a meal, basically apply that to my whole career. And I look for people that love to do the work. I am not looking for people who love to be in the business because this is pro. I, it's so funny. I have been talking about this for so with so many people over the last few months about I, how my entire career in this business, except for like the time, ironically, that I had to step away from the business for health reasons, it has always been this is the worst time in the business. And yet, for some reason, I have stuck in there because I still have this like I have this idea, and I kind of want do it this way and i i'm gonna figure this out i if it, i am like the most Taurus of tauruses in this way i am very very stubborn about figuring things out and if i want to figure it out i'm just gonna stick with doing it and that's kind of like where i am right now and i want to look for people who have that same kind of like internal drive and it's not just like the drive to like obsessively or compulsively produce material but it's like you're thinking about it you're you're testing yourself you're challenging yourself you're figuring out different ways to put together this kind of larger goal or larger scheme that you have which is why if i find someone who says like one of their goals is to get representation i kind of have already a question mark because that it's really just a starting gate. Tell me more about you, not what you're not what you're going to get. Like, tell me more about you and what you want and how you want to get there and how you want to build yourself towards this grander, larger scheme. Because I guess I, I, I guess I'm looking for people who have calling or people who have purpose or people who are like, I understand that TV screenwriting can be more than just it's a lot of things. It's a day job. It's stressful. It's a way to reach people. It's a way to connect. It's all of these different things. So like, tell me what your goal is to do inside of that. AE, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are welcome back anytime. Whether you want to talk more about Avalon or Thanksgiving dinners or any other fictional restaurant bar and club in TV and film, please, you get direct VIP access. Anyway, for those who want to reach out or at least see or read about the amazing things and the contributions that AE is giving to this world in terms of amazing stories, well, guess what? AE is out there. Check the socials. Check wherever you get your Hollywood insider news. And as for us with Restaurant Fiction, well, you found us. Whether that be iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you have a personal beef or if there was something you want to squash or compliment and pet our ego, which we really always appreciate. Well, guess what? Here is our email, monis at restaurantfiction.com. And until next time, nothing makes sense and nothing ever does. Cut to. Exterior. Interior. Restaurant. Bar Club Day Night